again, I welcome you to today's Tuesday Times Roundtable. If you didn't see it on the way in, there's a flyer by the sign-in sheet you may be interested in. It says Transformation at the top. This is a contest for any undergraduate student at FIU, and the prize is an all-expenses-paid trip to Washington, D.C., to go to the Peace Corps headquarters and meet as many federal government officials as we can possibly get to agree to meet with you. Um, the contest just involves describing a transformational experience in your life through virtually any artistic means that you can think of. An essay, poetry, sculpture, painting, photos, anything. Um, so if you're interested in that, that flyer is up there. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna introduce today's moderator while, while, you're, while we're getting ready to go. Um, so I'm excited to have today's moderator, Dr. Kate Komenars. She is the Associate Director of Counseling and Psychological Services, also known as CAPS, here at FIU. She is a licensed psychologist and a certified addiction professional with more than 20 years of clinical training and consulting experience in a variety of settings. She's a graduate of St. John's College with her bachelor's and Temple University with her master's and PhD. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in pr brief psychotherapy at Nova Southeast University's Center for Psychological Studies. Dr. Komenars has presented numerous courses, training sessions, and workshops on a wide variety of topics. Her most recent publication credits are from chapters in FIU's first year in college textbooks, and specifically chapters on time, stress, stressing, and stressed out. And so I have to, uh, the pleasure to introduce to you today's TTR moderator, Dr. Kate Komenars. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. I always hate to get dressed up and have no one to present to. So I really appreciate that you're here. As a moderator of this, it's never certain how many people are actually going to come. And so I'm, I'm very happy that, that a number of you are here. And hopefully, um, since you have plenty of other things you could be doing, hopefully as your takeaway, you're going to be happy that you spent your time here. Um, one of the reasons why um, I, I chose this topic is I've encountered over the years many people who have this idea that meditation is all about not thinking. And people have a hard time, right? Not thinking. What do we do naturally when we're awake? Think, right? How many of you have been told ever, you think too much? Yes, how many of you ever have felt not been told, but felt that you think too much. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge. You know, how do we define ourselves as human beings? Well, we think, right? And oftentimes we even remember what we thought about. So when we're thinking about thinking, it's kind of funny, right? We're thinking about thinking, I'm talking about thinking, we're going to be talking about thinking or not thinking, and it can be really kind of um, challenging to know where to go with that. But I wanted to, uh, hopefully you've gotten a chance to see, to, to read the article from the New York Times about mindfulness. It's, it's currently very much in the culture of people talking about, thinking about, discussing, right? You've seen this? People talking about mindfulness, people talking about what it is. <coughs> Oftentimes we, ha we, we, we sort of like have, think of what something is by the opposite, right? So mindfulness isn't the opposite of mindlessness because, as we know, when we're awake, oftentimes our mind is, is thinking even when we'd really rather that it was doing something else, right? So mindfulness is not mindlessness, uh, but we certainly know about that, right? Rushing through things, being human doings instead of human beings, right? Uh, having too much to do, too little time bumping into things, losing things, being careless, being forgetful, um, not noticing, for example, oh, I think I was hungry three hours ago. Hmm. Or, wow, I think I had a headache this morning. Hmm. Or, gee, where did I get that bruise? That must have hurt. That, that's one of the, any, anyone ever encountered that experience of, you know, wow, I must have run into something, and I don't mean your car, um, but run into some, some object with your body and say, wow, where did I get that bruise? Oftentimes we're so carried away or caught up in what's going on 
or what we're thinking about, that we're not paying any attention to who we are, how we're feeling physically, how we're feeling emotionally, what's happening to us in the world. So anyone ever had the experience where someone just introduces themselves to you? They tell you their name, and ba dum bum Do you remember their name? It blew away, right? Why? Why does that happen to us? We're thinking, yes. Or what else can happen sometimes? You're not paying attention. You're distracted. What else? Too much on your mind. Sometimes it's because you don't care. I heard that over here. But more of the, sometimes we're anxious, right? I don't like meeting new people, we might say. And oh, they're going to think something about me. Or what are they going to think about me? Or what might they have already heard about me? Or what might they say about me later to someone else? And in the midst of all that noise, who could remember someone's name? Right? Just as an example of all the kinds of things that can happen in our minds. So we can often be preoccupied either with ourselves, what are people going to think, or pre preoccupied with what just happened, or what we think is going to happen later. And so we're not really present when we're meeting someone. Or we're not really present when we're having a conversation with someone. Or we're not really paying attention to what's happening. Um, how many of you ever had the experience where you know you had lunch, but you can't remember actually having eaten it? Yes. So time to savor. Anyone know what savor means? What? To actually enjoy the food. That's what happens when we, we, we tend to savor really good things, right? But how many of us have had, after the fact, the sense that, oh, I think that was really good. I wish I had paid more attention. Yes, because oftentimes what we're doing is we're preoccupied not with what we're actually experiencing in our world out there and in here, but what's happening in our heads, right? What's happening in our heads. And that's really unfortunate because what do you remember? Do you remember all your thoughts five years later? Five minutes later, maybe five minutes later, but not five years later. But lots of what we do is spend energy in mindlessness. So let's talk about what mindfulness is. Certainly we have mind busyness going on, right? Lots of mind busyness. But let's talk about what mindfulness is. And one of the things that I think is really helpful to, to do is to make things as simple as possible so that we can hold on to it. You know, you can make a plan of 10 things to do, but most likely you're going to, in any one given day, maybe do how many of those 10? Three? Three? Can you be sure some days that you're going to do all three? Maybe not, but three is a good goal, right? So I like to put things in threes, in plus or minus one or two. So mindfulness is awareness and attention. Awareness and attention. Because things can happen, but if we're not paying attention to them, they didn't happen to us. Let me say that again. If things happen, but we weren't paying attention, they, they didn't happen to us. Now, I've had the experience of people telling me things, and if I wasn't fully paying attention, not only did I not hear it, but I'm certainly not going to remember it. Okay, so in order to have memory, we have to be paying attention and to be aware. So, awareness, that's kind of like the radar of our consciousness. If you're not aware, you can't take things in, but we are constantly monitoring what's happening on the inside and on the outside. And sometimes that's distracted, right? Because I'm moving around right now, and I just noticed I was making noise on the microphone. So we can get distracted, right? And awareness and attention together help us focus. 
attention is focusing awareness on a limited range of experience because our minds are taking in all sorts of things in this room, right? Things we see, things we hear, things we feel, but we're not paying attention to the temperature unless it's remarkable, right? If it's cold in here, we'll pay attention. If it's really hot in here, we'll pay attention. So, but our, our minds are taking in, or at least our brains are taking in that information, but we're not focusing on it, we're not paying attention to it, so it's not really in our conscious mind. Okay, with me so far? So, mindfulness is a way that we can change how we are relating to our experience. So, positive, negative, and neutral. A lot of times we only notice the things that are really positive or really negative, but we're not necessarily noticing the other things in between. And a lot of life is the between, right? A lot of life is the between. So one of the things that I like to think about is that this quote, let's not look back in anger or forward in fear, but around us in awareness. Lots of people are stuck in the past or focused on the future, fearful of the future, angry or sad or disappointed about the past, and they're missing the present. I think there was even a book written about that called The Present, because the present is where we actually live our lives. But often, we're not paying attention to that. It's happening as if it was a dream because we're kind of like not really there. So mindfulness is, about, is a way to be there when it's actually happening. Jon Kabat-Zinn started doing training in mindfulness in the 70s. And one definition of mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose, intentionally deciding to pay attention on purpose. In the present moment, what's happening right, right, right now. Not to judge it, not to evaluate it, not to say, is it good or bad? Do I like it or I don't like it? Do I wish it would continue? Do I wish it would stop? But just to experience it. Because we get into our heads when we start thinking, do I like it? Do I want this to be the way it is? Would I rather it be some other way? Oh, what about the last time? We're not in the present. We're not actually noticing, experiencing, aware, or attending to what actually is happening. We're in our heads. Okay, so non-judgmentally, we want to be aware, alive, awake to the unfolding of our lives in the moment. Moment to moment to moment. Now, now mindfulness also has a dimension of acceptance. When we're not judging, and we're not comparing, and we're not categorizing, and not, we're not saying, oh, if only this would either stop or start or never end or whatever, we can be in a place of accepting what happens as it happens. So, because we don't have to be worried about either it continuing or it ending, we're just in it, in it. Another quote is, change is the brother of acceptance, but it's the younger brother. Another way of thinking about it is, oftentimes we try to change the things we really can't change, and we try to accept things that we can change, and we have it all mixed up. And it's hard to tell the difference if you're in your head. So how do we get to acceptance? Anyone have anything in their life that they'd really, they really struggle with accepting? Let's hear it. What's a struggle? Traffic? Tell me you like the traffic here. No, traffic's one thing we can struggle with. Yeah. 
you have trouble accepting that in a free country we pay to get happy? Like that we that we don't have a whole trading system of like how it used to be like, hey, you have this, I have this, we'll exchange, opposed to we wake up and we think about money every day and we have to go to work and we spend majority of our time working and then you only have two days to spend to yourself and you only have this amount of money to use after you pay all these bills. It's like, so am I working just to live or, I mean, if you're living paycheck to paycheck. Right. So, so what's hard to accept is how focused so many people are on consuming and purchasing and spending and getting in order to have the sense of being alive or happy when stuff doesn't buy happiness. Does that sort of capture what's hard to ex accept? Yes, it is tough and, and to accept that. But also I want one of the things that we could do is how do we get around that? What do we do to accept that? Anyone else have an issue with that? That so much is about getting, finding, keeping, buying, selling, having, owning, trading. Is she alone? No. So let's talk about that. <coughs> yeah. You look like you're just about to say something. No? Who else ha has a thought? Please. I mean, I was thinking about, it relates to what you were saying, um, how like land, like you have to purchase land from a specific country or government. Who says like that they own that land? Like who really owns the land, you know what I mean? Like how did that come to be without um, someone saying this is mine and you have to pay to use it or to occupy it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so. so the concept of ha owning something um, can be challenging to accept. Um, how about owning ourselves? You know, isn't awareness about being who we are, noticing who we are? Oftentimes we're not noticing, we're not being, because we're involved in getting, finding, having, exchanging commodities, thinking about what's the newest thing to buy or to want. So that, that also can be a challenge, right? Other things that you struggle with. Yes. Yeah, and also we focus too much on material things. On the material, we are aware of what's the new trend, what's what's going on, the new car, this, that. that that's what it is in the world right now. That, that people wanting to have more, gain a better education, tuition, prices going up. And we want to have, like, a higher degree because the higher the, the degree that we get, the more money we could have, the more material we want, and live in luxury, the more luxury the material. So uh, focusing on acquisition. Uh huh. Other thoughts, J Justin. I'm thinking of uh, like mobility. So like it's not as easy to just like even move like across state. Across the country, just because there's so much tied into what you have to do, and it's exhausting. Like, to get recertified for a profession, you have to use a change your like, license, everything is so like, tied into doing that. And even if you go across like, like citizenship among states and among countries, like, you can't just get up and move to another country if you wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. So, that can be really stressful and hard to accept that there are these boundaries, or rules, or regulations, or you know, requirements. What what are other things that are difficult to accept? Good. Also, also accepting the, the fact when a family member passes away or something that could also be stressful. Also. Mm -hmm. So things like illness or loss. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's difficult to accept. Yeah. That 17,000 children die every single day by things we can prevent. Mm -hmm. That there's preventable illnesses or accidents that we could keep from happening. Just say more. UNICEF plug. <laughs> what? This is a UNICEF plug. Oh, a UNICEF, UNICEF plug. plug. It's by, thing. <laughs> by like, for example, as an example, um, 
you know, when a woman has HIV and her kid will be born with it unless she gets the medicine. That medicine only costs a dollar and eighty cents. That's like vending machine money to us. So we can we can prevent these things by educating people, by advocating, by fundraising for these children that are dying every day with illnesses, with uh, abuse, things like that, like all around the world. And so things we can prevent, and with just like petty change to us. Mm -hmm. So there are things that if we're aware of, if we focus on what we believe is really important and the things that matter to us and keep that as what is central, we can make a big impact. But when we're thinking about either what's occupying our minds or the messages that we get to consume or purchase or have more of, and we aren't paying attention to what really matters, then we're caught up in sort of other ways of being mindless. Yes? Does that sort of fit? Right? We get lots of advertisements, right? And they take us into all sorts of directions, but they don't necessarily help us stay or get connected or aware of what really matters to us. In the whole scheme of things, does it matter what kind of phone you have? Really? Does it? What do you see on television or on YouTube or in, on the internet? The opposite, that what phone you have really matters. Do you think if you live in other continents on the globe that what kind of phone matters? No, what does matter? That you have a phone if you need one, but if you don't need one, what really matters? I heard someone say water. Water, food, clean water, right? Clean water, like that Zephyr Hills bottle back there. You know, if you, mud, muddy water versus clean water. Hmm. Now that. That is something really importantly different, right? Well, in this, getting back to mindfulness, um, mindfulness can help us sort of lower the noise level, focus our attention on things that we care about, rather than being carried away by lots and lots of distractions. Now, the distractions of today were not the distractions of 200 years ago, but people got distracted then, too. It's not a modern phenomenon. It's just what we get distracted about now is different. So focused attention is something that people have been challenged with for hundreds of years. Now, nowadays, there's some, some really structured training programs to help you figure out how to be more mindful. And you can go on the internet and you can download audio files that will tell you all about different ways of uh, focusing concentration and other kinds of directed methods for this. And there's lots of good research that suggests that it's really valuable, that even as little as 12 minutes a day can help you become more mindful, more focused, more aware, and more attentive to the things that really are happening in your life that matter to you. Sound good? Yes, kind of like exercise. Sounds good, but what? What? Yeah, it only works if you work it. It only has a positive benefit if you actually do the exercise. The best health tip you could ever do for yourself is walk 30 minutes a day, every day for the rest of your life. That'll help you with stress. It'll help you stay fit. It will help you have perspective. And what do we do instead? We, what? We do all sorts of things that are sedentary. And we complain about parking because we have to walk from wherever we park our car to wherever we're going, as if we didn't need to use our legs. Don't we need to use our legs and our bodies? Yes, because if we don't, they atrophy. So what we know is that there's more and more evidence showing that mindfulness can improve 
our cognitive functioning, improve our health, increase our sense of enjoyment of our lives, because we're actually there more of the time to be experiencing our lives, and expand our ability to cope with illness, those losses and those unfortunate things that happen, and the things that we'd like to change but we really can't, except in small ways, and help us both physically and emotionally cope more effectively. So have I convinced you yet about mindfulness? Yes? No? Who needs more convincing? OK. Well, this is um, uh, a publication by Harvard. Now, Harvard publishes lots of stuff. Just because it's pu published by Harvard doesn't make it true. But it certainly is out in the common, um, um, out there in, in information world. And it definitely tells us that mindfulness helps us reduce stress and improve health. How many of you feel stressed? Oh, I'm, I, I'm impressed that everyone didn't put up their hand. But maybe it's because they're not currently feeling stress. How many of you ever feel stress? Yes. Stress happens, right? Stress happens. The question is, are we doing things that help us not have stress be chronic? Mindfulness really helps with that. OK. Now, what I'd like to ask you to do is think about all the different things that might keep you from actually doing some things that are healthy for you. Let's talk about the obstacles. What gets in the way from you doing something that you intend to do for yourself to be healthier? Let's, let's talk about that. Maybe I should put that off and study instead of going for that walk that I run that I want to do. Okay. So, anyone relate? Yes. Yes. So, other things come along and they seem more pressing. There's a little cartoon that I see in, in, one of, in my chiropractor's office and it goes along the line of, well, which would you rather be? Which would you rather do? Exercise one hour a day or be dead for 24 hours a day? It's kind of like we forget that this thing that we carry or that carries us around only lasts a certain time, right? And depending upon how well we treat it, it then treats us in response. And when we say, when we know that there are going to be exams, right? We know that there are going to be tests. We know that there are going to be crunch times. And often, what do we do? We procrastinate. We put off so there's a crunch, rather than knowing in advance that this is going to happen. So why should we stop doing the things that help us perform most effectively when we need to be at our best, right? So people say, well, you know, I'll cut back on sleep. Anyone cut back on sleep? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that that really helps? No. No. No, it doesn't really help, but we do it, right? So, and how, what happens? Are we mindful of how sleepy we are? No, not until we're sitting still and suddenly it's. What? During the exam. During the exam. Or so sleep deprived that all the cramming you did just didn't land anywhere, right? Or you get yourself so anxious that you're not able to perform or even appropriately convey what it is you know. So that sort of like procrastination and saying, well, I don't have time. Well, no one has time, except that we all have time, right? And it has to do with what are we doing with the time we have. And sometimes we're, wait, I, there's a, um, so I've seen this uh, picture of a mindfulness clock that the, the hours in the beginning are very big and the hours at the end are very squished together. It's kind of like if you, I mean, all the hours are the same length of time, 
So we can divide them up, right? And we can allocate them. And we can say, I'm worth 10 minutes a day to just be, right? Could you say that? Could you say that to yourself? I'm worth 10 minutes a day? Don't you think you are? What would get in the way of actually making that a reality? Tests? Traffic? What? Work? What else might be an obstacle? Children? Housekeeping? Did someone, someone, someone say that? Yeah. Uh, I love housekeeping because you know what? If you don't do it, what happens? You can get stressed over it, or you can decide something's got to give. Something's got to give. I used to have this routine that I had to have the house clean before I could study. <laughs> I do that. You know what happened? Study. Yeah. Because, you know, the thing is about a clean house, does it stay clean very long? No. No. If you have to have a clean house before you study, you could actually never have time to study, right? So you could change your expectation and say, okay, nobody dies with a not clean house, right? So it doesn't have to be as clean. Does it have to be filthy? No, it doesn't have to be filthy. That's the correct answer, by the way, right? Because that could be bad. But it doesn't have to be clean to your highest standards of cleanliness. That can give, right? So oftentimes, though, we have rules in our minds that it has to be this way. And what happens? Life comes along and it's not this way. It's some other way. So if we're mindful of what's really important and we're focused on the current situation, whatever that is, we can be flexible. We can say, okay. Maybe I can't go for an hour to the gym, or I can't walk for an hour, but I could do 20 minutes here and 10 minutes there, right? So we have choices. We have choices as to what we do with our time. And a lot of time, we don't actually intentionally do anything with it. How many of you feel really wonderful after you spend an hour watching television? <laughs> Do you feel more wonderful if it's two hours? Depends on what you're watching. Depends on what you're watching. Okay? Now, for the people who didn't raise your hand, there might be something else that you can feel really wonderful about doing for an hour. We all have to pick, right? You can't do everything in just a 20, nobody, no matter how rich they are or famous, gets more than 24 hours in a day, right? No matter what. The question is, what are you doing with the time you have? And oftentimes, we're not intentionally deciding what we're doing with our time. We're just sort of like accidentally doing the next thing. So mindfulness helps us set aside some time. Doesn't have to be a lot. 10 or 12 minutes has results. Actually, 12 minutes or a little bit more has results. And you don't have to do it absolutely every day. But the more days you do it, the easier it will be to keep doing it. Kind of like once you start a behavior, the more you continue doing it, the easier it is to keep keeping on doing it rather than starting. It's hard to start and stop and start and stop, but if you get into a routine, you can keep up the routine. Right. So the more you get used to something, the less you have to think about doing it. It just becomes part of your routine. What kind of routines do you have now? What? You have a school schedule, a work schedule, an exercise schedule. What? Anyone have a shower schedule? 
Yeah? I hope so, right? Or, you know, when you go to the, to get, you know, to stock up on groceries, right? Or is it just simply you go every time you're missing something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. how efficient is that? <laughs> not very, right? So part of, you know, but part of it is sometimes we're not paying attention to what we are missing, right? So paying attention really helps. What else gets in the way of paying attention and being aware? Sleepy, right. How many of you think of, of sleep as optional? You used to. What changed? You, can you say that a little louder? You didn't function efficiently. Yes. Do you, would it surprise you to know that people can be as impaired by sleep deprivation as they are with consumption of alcohol? Would it surprise you? Because mm -mm. I've been that delirious before, and um, I remember some friends were just like, you were so like, uh, and I remember feeling that way, like as if I was drunk, but not drunk, but it was just really, I don't know, I can definitely agree, because I was so delirious. Mm -hmm. Altered, right? Altered states. Sleep deprivation. Why do you say, think that it's been used as a method of torture? Because you can lose touch with reality, with sleep deprivation. You can also change your reaction times, as well as not really have your brain be ready to learn or per perform or recall, right? I've heard somebody, a couple of people said that Michael Jackson died because of continual days, one after another, of, after another, of sleep deprivation. He might have been not... He wasn't awake, but he wasn't asleep. Wasn't he poisoned or something? By a doctor? Well, that was administration of medication that made him pass out, lose consciousness, but not sleep. You cannot, can, part of what happens with sleep is our brain recovers with sleep. It, we need our brains to go to sleep to re remember things. If you're going to study into the night, anyone do that? Yes? After you're done studying, go to sleep. But have a routine of getting yourself calmed down, like with mindfulness, so you can calm yourself down and then go to sleep. Don't study and then do something else that involves your mind and then go to sleep because the things that we learn right before we go to sleep are more likely to be encoded in our memory. So, can you go from 60 miles an hour to zero mentally? No, you're going to need to calm your mind. Mindfulness is one of those things. This is not the venue for me to do a demonstration for you of mindfulness. Too many distractions. But you can go online and find some mindfulness sites and try it out. Because the purpose of mindfulness is to help you. It's kind of like thinking about our minds as if they were muddy creek, um, um, muddy streams. You know, the water's flowing. There's a lot of turbulence. You know, there's a lot of silt in the water. Mindfulness allows us to calm down, settle down, become still, and allow all the particulate, all the thoughts, to settle to the bottom so that we can be clear. Not that we're not going to be thinking. We will be thinking. But we'll notice that we're thinking. And instead of getting hooked by what we're thinking, we'll just notice. Just the same kind of way as if somebody walked by the front of the room. And we just notice, rather than getting involved with why are they there? What are they doing? What does that mean? We just notice. That's what mindfulness helps us do. Let all the noise just sort of calm down, settle down, so that we can just be. 
We'll be thinking. We think. We all think. Mindfulness is not about not thinking. It's about not getting churned up by the thinking that we're doing. So a stray thought passes by, we notice, and it goes. We're not distressed about it, we're not hooked by it, we're not rushing to catch up with it, trying to make it go away, we're just having it pass by. Sound like something you'd like to experience? If it is, check it out. Explore. Some things work differently for other pe some people than for others. But it's just tell yourself it's not about doing something that you get good at, and then you're good at it. It's something you practice, and you practice on an ongoing basis. And over time, you'll say to yourself, "Huh, I'm more aware. I'm noticing more." I feel more connected, more involved, more like I'm experiencing and living my life rather than rushing through it, going from one moment to the next without really noticing what's happening along the way. Comments, thoughts, application? We still have a few more minutes. Yes. Just for an application to go back to the original comment about feeling like you know all the bills are going away. I, whether it's bills or taxes, I try not to think about my pre-tax, pre-bill paycheck number. You know, I kind of just take all the things that have to be paid for up front and like mentally don't think about it as as numbers. I kind of think about it as you know I'm. I'm working, almost like you said that you wish we were trading. I kind of think of it as I'm trading, coming here, going to work, for having the place to live and with electricity and water and internet. And then like whatever happens to be left over after taxes and all the bills are paid at the beginning of the month is like the paycheck. So I kind of don't get hung up on the number of I'm paying this much in bills. It's like set things up automatically, the money comes in, the bills go out, and then you, you it's like you if you know all those things are things that you need. Like even taxes are hard to see because you don't really see the specific things it's going to. When you start thinking about bills, you start thinking about okay. When I think about all the bills, I think okay. Well, I'm in my house paying the bills. The reason I have a place to live is because I'm paying them. The reason I go online is because I'm paying them. The reason I can turn on the water is because I'm paying them. It's easy to think about water as like you know, it's just there. But you know, so I, I try not to think about the numbers. I try to think about. Whatever's left is, is what I get paid, and everything else is kind of trading with labor for, for a place to live in necessities. I don't know if that makes sense outside of my head, but I'm trying to get hung up on, those, on, on the, the numbers more than is necessary to maintain them. Yes, please. I have a question for you. When you were talking about time, you said sometimes looking at the clock kind of stresses you out more. I think that different things stress out different people differently. So if that's what happens for you when you wear a watch, then it makes sense that you wouldn't wear a watch. For me, I don't get stressed out by looking at my watch and pacing myself. I get stressed out when I'm late because I didn't have an awareness of the passage of time and I'm suddenly realizing, you know, I can't get from one side of campus to another just by thinking it. I need to actually get from here to there. So have, for me, having a watch helps me pace myself. But there are times that, for example, if there's a ticking clock in the room and I'm noticing it tick, 
that's going to be distracting to me. Um, but I think that you know, it's time. Time is going to pass whether we notice it or not. For me, I can get really absorbed in what I'm doing and lose track of the passage of time. So, for example, if I set aside 50 minutes or 20 minutes to do something, I will use, now that I have a phone that's easy to set a timer to, I'll set the timer so I won't get so lost in what I'm doing that I get out off pace. But my problem is sometimes, or my, one of the gifts I have is I can get very absorbed in the moment and then suddenly come, sort of like become aware that, oh, wow, more time passed than I was aware of. <coughs> Other things on your mind, please. We were talking about the new forms of sleep. Um, and we always hear that obviously eight hours a night is the ideal number that everyone should be sleeping, but sometimes that's not possible. Do you have a number, do you think, for students, is what is good enough? Well, you know, people just sort of like pick eight hours. For the most part, people somewhere are in the range of six to eight. Uh, some people need more. But you know that if you'll know you need more if, if you sit still and you start getting sleepy, you're going to know you are not getting enough sleep. Because sitting still and feeling relaxed shouldn't take you to sleepiness. And if it does, then you're not getting enough sleep. Now, the question is, can sometimes people think, well, I get five hours today and nine hours tomorrow and I'll even out. <laughs> sleep is not like putting money into a jar. You didn't need the money today for Starbucks, so you put it in, and tomorrow you'll take it out. No, sleep doesn't work that way. You might think it does, but it doesn't. No. So it's sort of yes. You can you can have a little less sleep than you need, maybe for one day, and maybe the next day. But by the third day, you know you're in a feeling. So I think it's a very individual thing as to what is just right for you. Um, I had to find out the hard way that because I could get myself to function on less sleep than I needed, it wasn't safe. I found myself having dozed off at the wheel on 75. And thankfully I was in the right hand lane so the bumpers hit, you know those little raised things went off and I came to, I wasn't fully asleep, but I was not uh, fully awake. So it can be really dangerous. Yeah, I heard in one of my classes that because our sleep cycle is like, each cycle is like three hours approximately, that so if you sleep six hours or nine hours, it's better like than like not within the three hour thing because then you like break in the middle of your uh, cycle or whatever and you'll be more tired than you would be otherwise, that's what I heard in my class. And, and, it's, and it's not exact. For some people they have a three hour cycle, some other people have a two and a half hour cycle. So it really depends, it's not, ex you know, everybody doesn't have the same sleep cycle. Some people, you know, have a, a longer or shorter uh, cycle, so, but it can be really challenging. If you, if you are woken up in the midst of a deep sleep, you're going to feel differently than if you wake up as you're coming out of the sleep cycle. But, you know, so that's, you know, it's just a general rule of thumb, not an exact <coughs> thing for everyone. Yes? Um, just for application for the whole sleep thing, I don't know if that's something that someone's suffering with, um, like don't have enough time to have sleep or things like that. Let's say if you take, let's say if you slept for six hours at night, take cat naps. It really does work and stay hydrated. Make sure you drink enough water and make sure you have a great diet. And when I say diet, I don't mean like, um, oh, you should eat, like putting yourself on a diet. I mean eating healthy as in diet, like proteins, vegetables, and a starch. Those type of things actually do give you much more energy. And if you happen to have like, let's say five minutes in between class, take a quick minute nap. It does revitalize your body really quick. It just, you know, 
I mean, it's not going to last you, but it definitely will get you pain. Yes, and for the people who can nap, that's great. For other people, they don't nap. They sleep or they don't sleep. And so for those people, mindfulness can be a, a very brief sort of recharge because you can kind of settle down, you can relax, you can get re-energized um, that way as well. Yes? That's an application where you're saying that this is something we should do the whole day or something that we just do for a short period of time? Well, I think that it's impossible to be, uh, to, to have our attention focused at all times in every situation. But when we practice, just in the same kind of way, exercise is good. We can't be exercising every minute of every day. So having you know set times to exercise is really helpful. It will make it easier to remember to do when we're busier. So mindfulness, intentional mindfulness time is really important to build into our schedule. But we're not going to be mindfully aware at all times. But hopefully we'll be paying more attention and more aware in a more you know, sort of here and now focus, the more mindfulness kind of training that we do. Does that answer that question? Other thoughts, other questions, comments? We have a mindfulness meditation group that meets at the Counseling Center, uh, actually in Student Health, on Thursdays from 2 to 3.30. If that's of interest, you can come to, to CAPS for um, a screening and find out whether that would be something that would work for you. Um, and there are, as I mentioned, lots of online resources. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, who was one of the, the quote, one of the quotations I had up on the, the PowerPoint uh, at Harvard, they have a stress reduction, stress reduction, mind, mindfulness-based stress reduction. MBSR is the acronym. But there are lots of um, audio files that are available. Uh, all you have to do is Google, in fact, online relaxation exercises, and you'll get lots of things that you can listen to that can help you figure out whether mindfulness is something that would be helpful to you. Maybe it's progressive relaxation. Maybe it's self-hypnosis. There are all sorts of techniques that can help people get more focused, get more relaxed, but still stay alert. Oftentimes, we associate relaxation with sleepiness, because that's the only time we're really relaxed, which is really unfortunate, isn't it? So much tension, so much stress gets in the way of really fully enjoying your life to the maximum. Now, I, anyone wonder what these jelly beans were for? Yes? Yes. Well, the reason why I brought these is there are lots and lots of different flavors, right? If you eat these in a handful, do you think it tastes good? Not really. It's kind of too many things, too many flavors. But if you eat them one at a time and savor them, they're all very unique. So we started by talking about savoring the moment. I brought them just in case you wanted to have an experience of savoring some jelly beans. So as you're leaving, if you'd like a spoonful, not a spoonful of, well it is a spoonful of sugar because jelly beans are sugar and flavor, but I wanted to share them with you. All right, I think that we are now at the time. So thank you all for coming.